Teens teen Marissa Middleton is no stranger to trouble. Marissa was not your typical teenager. Her focus was not on her education. She spent more time in the streets than she did at home or anywhere else. She dropped out of high school. She was headed down the wrong path. Unemployed with only a 10th grade education, Marissa mooches off her parents for financial support. And the former sophomore continues her wild child ways for the next few years. By the time she turns 19, she leaves her parents' house and stays with friends as her downward spiral gets worse. In fact, within a year of moving out from her parents' home, she was arrested for um, passing a bad check. Getting arrested is certainly a wake-up call that one is headed uh, down the wrong path. After her arrest, she moves back to her parents' home and gets a job to support herself. But after six years of trying to live a straight and narrow life, the now 26-year-old decides she needs a change of scenery. She left Colorado and moved to Manhattan, Kansas. Marissa could start all over. She could become a brand new person if she wanted to be. Moving to a new town is certainly a way to start one's life over again. It adds a form of excitement in that it's different from the same old, same old. It's fresh, it's exciting, it's new. She quickly falls in love with her new home and enjoys that there's always something to do. To spark up her social life in her new town, she gets a job as a bartender at a local strip club. It's a college town, so it's got its fair amount of bars and, and whatnot. From all appearances, she was doing well there. She was able to make ends meet by working at the strip club. She was socializing with the patrons. She was making new friends. She was making a name for herself. As her new circle grows, she is particularly drawn to one man who frequents the club, 28-year-old Larry Anderson. They hung out a lot. She enjoyed spending time with him and thought he was a great guy. Larry was handsome. He had a bright smile, a slick talker. As, as time went on, they got to know each other. They talked more and more. The couple date for a few weeks, going out to movies, dinners, and drinks, with Larry footing the bill at every outing. Larry seemed like a modern-day Prince Charming, and Marissa had never even asked him about, you know, what he did for a living. Marissa had had a pretty hard life, and when she met this guy, Larry, who was willing to shower her with attention and spoil her, she was quickly head over heels. But after dating for only a month, her Prince Charming's constant flow of cash sparks her curiosity. She was wondering where the, his money was coming from. She'd ask, but never got a direct answer from Larry. Then one day, while hanging out around Manhattan, he reveals his secret. According to Marissa's plea deal, he runs a small escort business in Manhattan and nearby Junction City. A lot of people that live in Junction City either work or are soldiers on Fort Riley. So those Fort Riley soldiers made up a large uh, portion of his clientele for his escort service. Even though she acknowledges her new man's way to earn a living, it's still a tough pill to swallow. To set her mind more at ease, Larry loops her in to how his little empire operates. And she was right there by his side, ride or die to the end. She made numerous trips from Manhattan to Junction City, and she was with him when he answered calls and supervised the girls. As time goes on, she has lingering questions in her mind about his relationship with some of the women he works with. When Marissa would travel to Junction City with Larry, she would notice that some of the girls got a little too close for comfort, and she did not like that. She became bothered by the girls' familiarity with Larry. She became bothered by the fact that they would call him and talk to him, that they would dress scantily in front of him. If you're insecure, you might second-guess someone who has proven themselves to be really trustworthy and honest to you, but your own insecurity really makes you think twice as to what may be going on. As Marissa's anxieties grow, her relationship with Larry becomes strained, and the couple begins to argue. Marissa confronted Larry about what she suspected with the girls, and Larry just straight out denied it. He said there was no dealing other than business with the girls. But no matter how bad their fights get, the two always manage to fall back in each other's arms. 
And with Larry's work keeping him 25 miles away in Junction City most of the time, she quits her job in Manhattan and moves in with Larry to keep her boy toy company. But oftentimes she finds herself alone while he's working. She didn't have a lot to keep her busy. Fortunately, she met a couple also stationed at Fort Riley, Chantrell and Drexel Woody, and they became instant friends. Larry came into the mix and all four of them would spend time together. With Larry's business keeping him busy at all hours, Marissa shares her anxieties surrounding her man and his stable. Chantrell and Drexel, they would reassure her and, and comfort her and just pretty much dismiss the claims and just tell her nothing's going on. Sometimes people need to be reassured verbally in order to feel better about themselves and their own insecurities. But Marissa's jealousy continues to fester in her mind, and she uses social media to check up on her boyfriend. Her mind goes into overdrive when she sees a post from a local escort that insinuates that her suspicions may be spot on. She found uh, comments made by Amanda Clemens, and she said on social media that they had been sleeping together. What Marissa found on Amanda's page just crushed her view of the perfect world that she and Larry were to share. Marissa saw it and just couldn't handle it. She was beside herself. She confronts her boyfriend, to which he denies ever hooking up with the lady of the night. Enraged, Marissa decides to punish the woman spreading stories about her man. She had in her head that Amanda, she, she needed to be taught a lesson, and she was going to teach that lesson. Quite often when someone is in a relationship, and they feel that that person is the one, they'll go to incredible lengths in order to keep that relationship and make sure no one else is getting involved in that relationship. Full of rage, Marissa vows revenge on Amanda for making up such lies. With Larry on board, the two head over to their friends Drexel and Chantrell Woody's home to enlist their help. Because Drexel had never met Amanda and she didn't know who he was, the plan was for him to pretend to be a client or at least get Amanda to invite him to a very specific location. With a strategy in place, Drexel makes the call to Amanda, which she readily accepts. Excited by the promise of two women about to battle it out for him, Larry won't be left behind, and the three drive to the hotel while Chantrell stays at home. When they arrive, Drexel knocks on the hotel room door while Marissa and Larry stay out of sight. Thank you, thank you. Drexel interacted with Amanda for some time. They discussed various things that she would be willing to do for him, and then he told her he had to get money out of his car. What's going on? Before he could leave the room, Marissa and Larry walk in. The second that Marissa saw Amanda in the room, she jumped on her. She started beating her, fighting, scratching, clunk, pulled her hair. She was full on attack mode. Sometimes when a person is overcome with anger, instead of confronting the situation in a peaceful or constructive way, they just can't help themselves and respond in many ways through violence. While the two women go at it, Larry stands off to the side with Drexel watching his girlfriend's fury. He didn't lay a hand to break them apart or to stop the violence. I think Larry was a bit flattered by the attention. I think Larry liked the idea that these two women were fighting over him. After watching the two fight for a few minutes, Larry finally pulls them apart and orders Amanda to hand over some money she shorted him. Larry started claiming that Amanda owed him $300. She only had about $150. Unable to produce the full amount owed, Larry drags Amanda to the car, and the group drives back to Drexel's house. Amanda didn't know what was going to happen next. She was scared, and she knew she had no control and no say other than to go where they took her. When they got back to the house on post, Chantrell was shocked to see Amanda with them. Amanda and Marissa engage in this back and forth about Larry and who had had a relationship with him. The two women battle it out, kicking and screaming at each other. Marissa was physically attacking Amanda. At some point in that altercation, Marissa fell and hit her head. She was still mad at Amanda. She's still on her case. 
and she even told her that she could work off her debt to Larry um, by getting another trick. Um, Amanda was becoming more and more afraid and wondering when or if she was going to get out of there. Amanda agrees to get another client to pay her debt, but begs Marissa to let her make a quick call to check on her son. The battled attacker reluctantly agrees, but keeps a watchful eye on her. The single mother makes the call, but instead of talking to her son, her mom picks up the phone. Her mother could hear that she was crying and that she was upset. Amanda becomes emotional hearing her mom's voice. She suspects that her daughter is in trouble and asks if she should call for help. Amanda replies with a yes and hangs up the phone. Amanda's mom knew something was not right. Immediately, she contacted the police, and the police, not knowing where to find Amanda, called her cell phone. The police called the phone number back to see if she was OK. Marissa snatches the phone from Amanda before she can give the cops their whereabouts and disconnects the call. Aware that the police are now involved, the group scrambles to come up with a new plan. I think their main focus was to hide. The police were looking for them. But there's one person standing in their way. They knew that if they let Amanda go, that she could identify them, that she could tell them exactly who they were, and that she could tell the police exactly what had happened and how they had attacked her and assaulted her. They knew what it would mean for Amanda to get away. They had to realize they had gone too far, and now there was no turning back. Amanda had to be silenced permanently. When people start to panic, bad decisions inevitably are made, and the situation just spirals out of control. Larry, Marissa, and Drexel force Amanda in the back of the car and drive to a remote bridge near G remains at the house. According to Larry's plea deal, Marissa continued on her violent path. Once they got to the bridge, Marissa immediately gets out of the car, drags Amanda out of the car, and starts beating her up again. They engage in a physical altercation where Amanda's fighting back and trying to get away. Amanda is able to get out of Marissa's hold and runs. She comes up to the side of the bridge and looks down. She was scared for her life. She knew that if she didn't get away, this was going to be the end. And she jumped. When she jumped off the bridge, she fell 15 to 16 feet and landed on the embankment. Amanda miraculously survives the fall and tries to get up. But this is where her luck runs out. According to Larry's plea deal, Marissa starts to violently attack Amanda yet again. Only this time, she has a weapon. She thought she had a chance to get away. Then she realized her ankle was broken and she couldn't run. And before she knew it, Marissa was right there on top of her, just as angry, but this time with a knife. With eyes full of rage, Marissa swings the knife at the injured woman. She tried to slit her throat but because of their size difference, she wasn't able to do that. According to Larry's plea deal, he sees that his girlfriend is having a hard time fighting off Amanda. So he steps in. Larry, Marissa, and Drexel run down to stop Amanda, armed with a knife. Larry approached, took the knife from Marissa, and he's the one that actually killed Amanda. As Amanda's lifeless body lay on the ground, her three captors make no effort to cover their brutal crime. They just walked away. They left her body on the embankment. The trio head back to Drexel's house, where they attempt to get rid of anything that can track the murder back to them. They did their best to clean up the evidence of what had happened. Chantrell and Marissa did their best to wash away evidence. Larry and Drexel destroy Amanda's cell phone. They wanted no evidence that Amanda had been with them that day. While the group is covering their tracks, Police are already trying to solve the mystery of Amanda's disappearance. Their big break comes two days later, when they find Amanda's body under the bridge six miles outside of Junction City. Investigators search the area, but come up empty-handed. Next, they turn their attention to Amanda's friends to see if they have any idea who could have done this. By talking to her associates, they managed to connect Amanda with Larry, 
They track Larry down to his apartment where they found him with Marissa. The couple is brought down to the station for questioning, where they both deny involvement in the murder. But police continue to pry, and eventually Marissa and Larry break down and confess. Although their loyalty to each other has seen its limits. Larry told police that it was Marissa who inflicted the stab that killed Amanda. And Marissa told police that it was Larry who inflicted the, the fatal stab into, into Amanda. So, so their stories didn't add up at all. When couples are under some sort of pressure, especially when we're talking law enforcement, sometimes they'll just turn on one another. After several hours of questioning, Marissa finally comes clean. Marissa told the police that she thought it was her job to teach Amanda a lesson for two reasons. One, she owed Larry money. And two, she was telling lies about her relationship with Larry. She also admits to police that their friends, Chantrell and Drexel Woody, helped out with their plan. Police track the couple down and arrest them for kidnapping resulting in death. They each admit to their part and plead guilty to the charges against them. Drexel Woody is sentenced to 16 years in prison and five years of supervised release. Chantrell's sentence is still pending. Larry Anderson is charged with one count of kidnapping resulting in death. He pleads guilty and is sentenced to 28 years in prison. As for Marissa Middleton, she pleads guilty to conspiracy to commit kidnapping resulting in death. She is sentenced to 28 years in prison. In the end, Marissa let her jealousy and anger consume her thoughts that caused her ultimate downfall. I think Marissa felt like Amanda was a threat to this dream that she had of a life with Larry and was determined to do whatever she needed to do to get her out of the way. People who are amped up on their emotions tend to lose focus, tend to lose uh, perspective and end up hurting not just other people, but even themselves. Marissa lost everything. She lost hope for love, hope for a future. She lost her youth, she lost her freedom. She lost it all for a man. Marissa Middleton's heightened emotions took her down a dark path that turned deadly. Next, over 1,200 miles away in Las Vegas, Melanie Costantini is determined to do anything she can to keep her family together. Growing up in Katy, Texas, 16-year-old Melanie Costantini's future is on a solid path to success. She was a straight-A student. She had her whole life ahead of her and she wanted to go to college one day. Melanie loved kids and was hoping to work with them in the future. Popular with her classmates, Melanie is well-liked by her peers and has her fair share of admirers. But there's only one guy that catches her eye, fellow classmate Anthony Steiger. Anthony was the strapping football player, um, basically muscle from head to toe. Melanie and Anthony were immediately attracted to each other. They both thought each other was smart, attractive, outgoing, sociable, so they immediately clicked. They hit it off right away. It doesn't take long before the two start dating, but by their junior year, Anthony gets in trouble with the law for theft. He received a deferred adjudication in relation to the theft of a firearm and a stolen vehicle. Basically, he has to stay out of trouble during that time until he's an adult and he'll never see any prison time. When you see a juvenile getting in trouble, even in high school, uh, that usually is a red flag or some sort of a foretelling as to a path that they're going to follow, which is one of trouble down the road. Despite his troubles, Melanie is still head over heels with the good-looking athlete. These two were young and in love. She just chose to stand by him and support him whatever he was going through. A year later, the couple is still going strong, but their plans for a happily ever after hit a snag after Melanie gets some life-altering news. She became pregnant before they were 
graduated from high school. This was an unplanned pregnancy, and they decided to go ahead and have the child. Anthony put his big boy pants on, decided to go ahead and propose to her, which is admirable for him. The two decided that they weren't going to get married until they both graduated. The following year, the young lovers tied the knot in front of Melanie's family and their new baby girl by their side. Melanie's family supported the couple to the extent where Melanie and Anthony lived in Melanie's family's house. Probably at this time, they were trying to figure out what are we going to do, what's our next step. When a young couple, for example, teen parents, are forced to raise their child, not only do they have to prove it to themselves, but they have to prove it to others that they can actually raise that child and provide safely for him or her. To support the family, Anthony works as an auto mechanic, while Melanie continues to put in time at her mom's daycare facility. Two years later, the young family know they can't live with Melanie's parents forever. And as luck would have it, Anthony receives a new career opportunity. Anthony received an offer to move to Las Vegas and work as a handyman in an apartment complex. And uh, he was offered $400 per month and uh, a free apartment in the complex. They were able to get out of their parents' roof and get their own freedom. And who wouldn't want to come to Las Vegas to, you know, actually start their new life and have free rent? The family of three move into their new Las Vegas apartment without a hitch. But once they have settled into their new home, they immediately feel the financial restraints from moving to Sin City. Obviously, $400 a month is not going to meet the budget of a household of a you know, two growing adults and a child. And yeah, they had free rent, but he needed another job or she was going to have to work. We need I know. Money coming in. It's not like we're spending it, I'm saving everything. That I we believe that Anthony really did not take into consideration what the actual move would take. He didn't really take into consideration the cost of raising a family in another city. It just wasn't enough, they were living paycheck to paycheck and trying to support their child. Putting in long hours and still not being able to make ends meet can really put a strain on a relationship. And quite often, it's just so much easier in some people's minds to take shortcuts to making up that money that they weren't able to make in the first place. To help make ends meet, Melanie takes a part-time job at a clothing store. With Melanie now working, they are in dire need of a new car. So with the little money they do have, they manage to secure financing for one. They uh, obtained a very high interest loan and got a uh, dark blue four-door sedan on payment plan. It wasn't easy for Anthony and Melanie to get that car. The insurance rates were high, and Anthony actually had to borrow 80 bucks from a friend of his just to take the car home. How much? kept butting their heads against the wall, and they kept wanting to make more money, but the jobs that they were in were, were not allowing them to advance. Money is the number one stressor in most relationships, and not being able to make an adequate amount of money can lead to that relationship breaking down. As I like to say, no money, no honey. Four months after moving to Vegas, the couple continued to live on a tight budget. While things seem to be going well for Melanie at her job, tensions rise between Anthony and his landlord boss. Harold Schill lives in the building. Harold would not really acknowledge Anthony's request. There were many things around the apartment complex that, An that Anthony wanted to repair and wanted to fix, and Harold would just not spend the money. He was, he was against it. Anthony also wanted more money to provide for his family, and that was something that Harold refused to do too. Financially strapped, Melanie and Anthony discuss how to make a quick buck and decide that stealing money from their landlord, who owns not one, but two apartment buildings in the area, might be an easy solution. Anthony started to see him as being the means to their end. He started to plot at this time, maybe taking that money from Harold. Anthony started to search online, quickest ways to kill, quiet ways to kill someone, cutting someone's throat and screaming. He works to perfect their scheme for the next month while waiting for the perfect opportunity to carry out his devious plan. 
Then, one day, Melanie and Anthony are in their apartment with their sleeping two-year-old when Harold knocks on their door. Shortly after his arrival, an argument ensues between Anthony and Harold. They start arguing with each other about the repairs that needed to be done at the complex. Harold actually responds to Anthony and tells them that it's not going to happen. Anthony gets very frustrated by his response. The verbal argument turns physical as Melanie moves to pull the two scuffling men apart. Once they separate, Anthony and Melanie demand that Harold turn over his checkbooks. Just give us the checkbooks. When Harold refused to pass over his checkbooks, Anthony then looks at an electric saw and he tells Harold that if he doesn't comply with them, he will kill him. As you can imagine, this was a horrific scene. We have a, an electric saw going. Anthony is taking swings at Harold. He actually hits him on the head. He actually hits him on the side of his face. While this fight is breaking out, Melanie is standing by and probably worrying about her daughter who is sleeping in the next room. The two men continue to fight throughout the apartment. Harold tries to get away from Anthony and the Saul, but the 58-year-old is no match for the younger man. The fight ended up in the bathroom, where Anthony was able to take full control of the saw and make a large cut on Harold's neck. Once Harold got cut, he just bled to death. Surprisingly, the couple's daughter did not wake up during this entire situation. And if she had woken up, it could have been very traumatic for her. Sometimes individuals see violence as a means to an end. And when they get into that mindset, they don't care how many people they hurt. They just want to get their mission accomplished by any means necessary. As Harold's lifeless body lay in the tub, Melanie springs into action. She reached into Harold's pocket and grabbed the keys to his apartment. Her and Anthony immediately ran to Harold's apartment to search for checks that they could later cash. It seems at this moment that they felt that their plan was working out for them. Oftentimes in the heat of the moment, adrenaline kicks in, that fight or flight, and people do whatever they think is necessary in order to get what they want. With blank checks in hand, the couple returns to their apartment, relieved that their daughter is still sleeping. I'm gonna go to the truck next After changing out of his bloody shirt to prepare what he needs to get rid of Harold's body, Anthony leaves the apartment again. With Harold's lifeless body still in the bathroom, Melanie gets on her laptop and begins to search for information on using forged checks from his bank. After she um, figured out where she can cash those checks, she decided it was time to uh, clean up the crime scene. She went into the bathroom and scrubbed that down, and that's where most of the blood was. The adrenaline rush just doesn't last that long. And so when it does wear off and you come to your senses and realize that what you did was illegal, well, now you're in cover-up mode and you realize the totality of your actions. Meanwhile, Anthony goes to a local truck rental facility half a mile away. He told an employee that he needed a big box to put his shoes in, and the employee gave him a wardrobe box. So Anthony ended up leaving this, the truck facility with a wardrobe box, tape, a storage unit, and the truck that had a dolly in it as well. He then raced home, uh, left the keys in the truck, left the truck running, and uh, went upstairs to help Melanie put the body in the box and get it into the truck. The couple begins to dismember Harold's body so they can box it up, but they have a hard time doing so. They're using that electric saw that they used to cut him, and they realized that it just wasn't strong enough to cut Harold's body. It's not working. All they could manage to get off of the body was the tip of his thumb. So they decided to put the body as a whole into the wardrobe box and move it out of the apartment. The huge box is too heavy for the couple to lift alone, so they use the rental dolly and head out the door. But as they make their trek outside their apartment, something stops them in their tracks. With the siren? They freeze. They're 
very scared about what's about to happen and they assumed that the police sirens were police looking for them. The couple panics and run back to their apartment, leaving the truck running with Harold's body outside. Melanie quickly changes as Anthony stuffs a few belongings and Harold's blank checks in a bag. They grab their sleeping daughter and take off in their car. Most times when you do something bad, eventually the guilt starts to kick in and you'll do anything to get yourself out of trouble. Their ultimate plan was to take the, the body in the box and take it back to the storage facility where they would keep it in a, in a storage room. And now instead of having a, a well-planned crime, they've left the body behind in a box to be discovered and they're on the run, which uh, was not part of their plan. When people are in a crisis situation and they're completely overwhelmed by whatever's going on, they tend to run away in order to save their own hides. Later that evening, with their two-year-old daughter in tow, the young parents drive towards California, where Anthony's mom lives. Their hope is to drop their child off with her while they go into hiding. But along the way, they make a pit stop to cash a few of Harold's checks for some spending money. Back in Vegas, Harold's body is discovered a few hours later. It was actually a resident that found that box and saw Harold's body inside of it. The tenant then called 911. When the police arrived at the scene, the first thing that they noticed was the rental truck still running um, right outside of the apartment complex. Officers also noticed that the rental truck and the uh, dolly that was on scene were from the same company. Investigators rush to the truck rental facility to see if they can give them any information on who signed for the truck. Once detectives arrived, they uh, requested to see surveillance video. And uh, as they watched the video, they saw Anthony uh, renting the truck as well as purchasing the large box. Armed with this new information, police obtain a search warrant for Melanie and Anthony's apartment. And once they open the door, a strong scent greets them. They immediately smelled the cleaning products that Melanie had used to clean the apartment. They entered the bathroom, which had appeared to be scrubbed clean. They saw what appeared to be blood evidence and blood throughout the bathroom, which was not apparent to the naked eye. They also found a black plastic bag in the apartment, which contained bloody clothing, which had trace blood evidence on it as well. But that is not the only evidence that ties the two 20-year-olds to Harold's murder. They found his glasses and the tip of his right thumb. It appeared that Melly and Anthony had left in such a hurry and were so panicked that they did not realize they left so much evidence behind. After completing the search of the apartment, detectives begin the task of tracking down the two suspects. Five days later, as police continue their investigation, Melanie and Anthony finally make it to Anthony's mom's house in the Golden State after making stops to spend more of Harold's money. After they left the daughter at the mother's house, they decided to have a little fun. They went to the nearest amusement park and had a whole bunch of fun on Harold's dime. At the same time, investigators learn about the car they bought, and it becomes their ultimate undoing. They were able to immediately locate the two pretty fast. Police were able to pinpoint the couple's location in Venice Beach, California, where they were arrested by local police and the FBI. Upon their arrest, police find the final nail in their freedom coffin. Checks from Harold Schilberg's bank account inside Melanie's purse. They also found $1,900 in cash in her purse, and they found $400 on Anthony, which was most likely his paycheck. LAPD had them in custody, and then they were eventually extradited back to Las Vegas. Both are charged with murder with a deadly weapon, robbery with a deadly weapon, and burglary. Melanie's loyalty to her husband runs deep, and she confesses how she helped Anthony with the crime, but the duo enter a not guilty plea, with Anthony stating the attack on Harold as self-defense. Most likely to spend the rest of their lives in prison, Anthony decides to cut a deal with prosecutors to avoid having their daughter go without both her parents. Anthony um, decided to be the man of the situation and take the brunt of the responsibilities for the murder. As a result of Anthony's plea, Melanie Costantini pleads guilty to a lesser charge of second-degree murder and robbery and is sentenced to 25 years in prison. 
As for Anthony Steiger, he pleads guilty to first-degree murder with a deadly weapon and receives life in prison. In the end, Melanie's desire to keep her family together backfires when she lets greed take hold. Sometimes women are manipulated or fall prey to a situation of where they'll do anything they feel that they have to in order to hold on to that man, even if it's something crazy, because many times there may be that pot of gold or reward waiting for them uh, at the end of this relationship. Melanie did not make a good decision with the man that she hooked up with. There were some problems there that should have been concerning to her and to her family, but um, they kept on going down a path, and that criminal path is now leading them to some serious time away in prison. Melanie, from the beginning, was in over her head. She had a bright future ahead of her. It snapped away from her pretty quickly.